Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nick Spencer. I'm senior fellow at Theos, and it's a great pleasure to see exactly the right number of people turn up tonight. You might have thought we planned it like this, and we did. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 11th annual Theos Lecture. Theos was launched 12 years ago with the support of the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster, but we were then and we remain independent of any particular Christian denomination. We exist to tell a better story about faith in general and about Christianity in particular. Better in the sense of more accurate, but also better in the sense of more positive. It's fair to say we live in turbulent times. And questions of belief, of identity, of how we engage with people who think and believe differently to ourselves are livelier than they've been for a long time. We believe that beliefs matter. There is no neutral, secular view from which we can order society. But we're also passionately committed to the common good, a common good to which everybody is enabled and encouraged to contribute. We conduct research, publish reports and books, and do public debates, podcasts, and media work. Some of our recent publications are available tonight, including our most recent report by Paul Bickley, looking at people, churches, and neighborhood resilience in the Northeast, entitled Place and Purpose. Do have a look at it and the other reports after the lecture. Now, our reports and our publications are the foundation of our work, but the high point is undoubtedly the annual lecture, of which, as I've said, this is the 11th. Our very first was with Mark Thompson, who was then Director General of the BBC, who gave an extremely thoughtful, subtle, and careful lecture, which ended up on the front page of the Daily Star two days later. <laughs> Since then, we've had many eminent lecturers, including Jonathan Sachs, Rowan Williams, Honora O'Neill, and Marilyn Robinson. Last year, we hosted Tim Farron, deliver a lecture that was described by one commentator as the bravest public lecture he'd ever heard by a sitting MP. Now, I'm never sure whether that's a compliment or a mortal threat to an MP. I'm always reminded of the fact that whenever Sir Humphrey Appleby wanted to deter Jim Hacker from doing anything, he would look him squarely in the eye and say, that's the bravest decision you've ever made, Minister. Either way, with the Daily Star at one end, and the bravest political speech in history at the other, the bar has been set very high tonight. Over the last five years, we have been hugely grateful to be working in partnership with CCLA for our annual lecture. For those of you who don't know them, CCLA is one of the UK's leading charity fund managers. It was set up over 50 years ago to serve the interests of mission-driven organizations that were not well served by the financial services industry. Today, it has over 40,000 churches, charity, and public sector clients. It provides the secretariat for the church's investors group, and it's ranked top manager of social and responsible investment funds in the UK. Appropriately, given the subject of our lecture tonight, CCLA takes climate change and environmental ethics very seriously indeed. It engages with public policymakers to try and promote a legal framework that promotes an accelerated and orderly transition to a low carbon economy. It's part of the United Nations backed Principles of Responsible Investments Investor Working Group. And it created and convened the Aiming for A initiative that's filed successful climate shareholder resolutions at BP, Shell, Rio Tinto, Glencore, and Anglo-American. All in all, then, CCLA has a great reputation for its environmental stewardship and ethics, and we're particularly pleased and grateful to be working with them again this evening. I was talking recently with a friend from CCLA, and he mentioned that when they started first partnering with Theos on the annual lecture about five years ago, they managed around £5 billion for charities and churches and faith groups. And today, it's around £8 billion. So if anyone here still has any doubts about the benefits of partnering with Theos for anything, <laughs> speak to someone from CCLA. Tonight's event is being live streamed 
and recorded. If you want to tweet, the hashtag is TheosGove. And if you want to ask a question, and there will be opportunity for questions after the lecture, we'd like you to text your question to the number behind me on the screen. And that number will remain up for the duration of the lecture. We're always grateful to our annual lecturers. But this year, I confess, the gratitude was mixed up with a fair amount of relief. Last week was a tumultuous one in Parliament and politics, with resignations and speculations right, left, and centre. And it did feel as if half an hour was a long time in politics, let alone a week. So for that reason, we are both grateful and relieved to have our speaker tonight. And I'm now going to hand over to the director of Theos, Elizabeth Oldfield, to introduce him. Good evening and thank you. Yes, Theos is delighted to welcome the Right Honourable Michael Gove, Secretary of State for Environment, Farming and Rural Affairs tonight. Michael was born in Edinburgh and adopted at the age of four months. About five years later, his younger sister was also adopted into the same family. He studied there and went on to study English at Oxford University and thus followed a career in journalism, including some time at the Today programme and at the Times as a leader writer and comment editor. In 2005, he was elected as Conservative Member of Parliament for Surrey Heath, became Secretary of State for Education in 2010 and Secretary of State for Justice in 2015. He played a major role in the 2016 Brexit referendum and took on the DEFRA brief just last year. He's going to speak to us for about between half an hour and 40 minutes, we think, then I have the opportunity to interview him a little bit, uh, and then we're going to open up from your questions. And they will come to me, we hope, uh, by the magic of technology um, on the iPad. And that also allows those of you, welcome, watching on the live stream to send questions via Twitter or Facebook with the hashtag TheosGove. So they will be collated and sent to me. After that finishes, and we will finish promptly at nine o'clock because Michael needs to get away and I would ask you to let him get down the stairs rather than mobbing him uh, so we can honour that promise to allow him to get back to his family. Um, we can all head next door for wine and canapes and I really hope you'll stay with us for that. So with no further ado, please welcome the 2018 Theos Annual Lecturer. Thank you all very much for your welcome. And can I thank Theos for providing um, the platform this evening? Um, uh, I don't know if there's an irony in the fact that we're here in this magnificent temple of mammon that is the Institute of Directors, but thank you anyway uh, to all of you for coming along this evening. And it's a particular pleasure to be speaking to Theos because since its establishment, Theos has done absolutely invaluable work in enriching our political debate by asking us all to consider public policy dilemmas with the help of the wisdom embedded in religious traditions. Of course, these days, any discussion about the role that religion or faith should play in politics always raises very difficult questions. Are those who profess a personal faith attempting to claim somehow a superior authority for their political views, which is denied to others? Well, I certainly don't believe that. Indeed, as a Christian, I recognize that we are all flawed individuals in a fallen world. We're prone to error, and to arrogance. And any attempt to arrogate to ourselves the mandate of heaven for our actions would be the height of hubris and brittle folly. But more than that, I believe that we are fortunate to live in a pluralist society. And the clash of contending views, uninhibited by censorship, is vital to ensuring that our democracy remains strong. Dissent, skepticism, challenge, even when that's offensive to some, are all essential to keeping our politics healthy. And in the political debates that we all conduct, we should always try to advance policy on the basis of logic and evidence. We should try to persuade people of all faiths and of none that a particular course is justified by appealing to their judgment and their reason. But in making our arguments, there are rich resources that we can all draw on in the history and philosophy of different faiths. The example of British politicians from Shaftesbury to Gordon Brown and Wilberforce to Frank Field, who've been inspired by religious tradition to make progressive arguments, commands respect 
across partisan and ideological divides. The contributions of chief rabbis from Lords Jacobowitz and Sachs to Ephraim Mervis, and of Archbishops of Canterbury, from William Temple and Cosmo Gordon Lang to Rowan Williams and Justin Welby, have all enriched our political debate. Muslim public intellectuals such as Mona Siddiqui, Taj Hagi and Ed Hussein have all contributed to a more thoughtful consideration of public policy in Britain. And Sikh, Hindu and Buddhist faith leaders in Britain all play an invaluable role in widening the perspectives of policymakers on questions from educational opportunity to social care. And it's not just individual leaders and thinkers, but also the philosophical systems inspired by religious traditions which contribute to deepening our contemporary politics. The idea of the common good, embodied in Christian thinking, and especially in Catholic social theory, has inspired some of the most original and interesting political thinkers of our time, from Alistair MacIntyre to Morris Glassman, John Crudus to Michael Walzer. The principle of subsidiarity in the exercise of political power, the idea of a covenant between generations. Indeed, as Professor Larry Seedentop reminds us, even the idea of the individual itself all derive from religious philosophy. So while we should never claim that arguments drawn from faith provide a warrant for political action, neither should we ever apologize for drawing and reflecting on the insights and wisdom found in the words, actions, and thoughts of religious leaders. And therefore, in reflecting on what we might learn from our faith traditions when considering the fate of our shared environment and the future of food, I hope no one will misinterpret my motives when I turn to one of the most resonant lines in scripture. In the gospel according to John, Jesus declares, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus casts himself as he speaks as a good shepherd, caring for his flock through all vicissitudes and bringing them to a life more abundant through a time of trial. Abundance in the literal sense of plenty and richness is one of the features of our times. Now, don't get me wrong, there is poverty, certainly, scarring the lives of far too many, even in our own relatively wealthy nation. And the narrowed horizons that poverty inflicts on so many of our neighbors is a reproach to the conscience of all of us in public life. But overall, as a world, we live now in a time of unprecedented bounty. Whereas in 1820, the vast majority of people lived in extreme poverty, and only a tiny elite enjoyed higher standards of living, economic growth since then has completely transformed our world. Poverty has fallen continuously, even as the global population has increased. Economic growth powered by markets, innovation and technology and medicine, human creativity and cooperation has, even in my lifetime, lifted billions out of destitution and subsistence living, and given the wealthiest among us unparalleled comforts. Every day in this country, the market performs a million daily miracles to bring safe, nutritious, delicious food to our tables. And most of us are fortunate enough to live in warmth and safety, energy supplies harnessed from the earth, heating our homes, powering our commerce, and allowing us to communicate and learn from each other more freely than ever. But again, this abundance has come from our harnessing of the earth's resources in a manner which raises profound questions about our future trajectory and existence. There are now more than 7 billion people on this planet, and current expectations suggest that this number will rise to at least 10 billion, well before my own teenage children become my age. Population growth on this scale and everything that goes with it pose particular challenges, not least for our Earth, our home. Now, I am not, I should say, a bleakly pessimistic Malthusian, who believes there's a precise mathematical limit to how much population can ever grow. Indeed, I believe not just that every life is precious and every soul unique, but many of those who will be born in the years ahead will prove capable of developing the breakthroughs which change our expectations of what is possible. But at the same time, I'm profoundly conscious that the way in which we've been growing in population terms and economically has imposed costs and strains on our planet that require us also to have more than just a blithe faith that we can carry on as before and all will be well. Because I fear we are near a tipping point. And in recognizing the scale of the change we face, I hope you won't mind me quoting from another writer I love. 
In Ernest Hemingway's novel, The Sun Also Rises, two characters are discussing their misfortunes. Bill asks his friend Mike, so how did you go bankrupt? In two ways, Mike replies, gradually, then suddenly. <laughs> gradually, then suddenly. That is so often how change occurs. Gradually, societies become reliant on debt. Then suddenly, a financial crash occurs. Gradually, discontent with rulers mounts. Then suddenly, a revolution sweeps the established order entirely away. And that is how change has been occurring on our planet. Gradually, then suddenly. In the millennia that we've been on this Earth, our impact on it has been very gradually growing. Originally, our species hunted and gathered, omnivorous and sometimes rapacious, but not fundamentally altering nature's balance. Then we discovered how to harness energy from nature, first through fire, generating heat by burning peat, wood, and surface coal. While our access to those resources was limited, uh, we then learned, subsequently, to mine the vast reserves of coal, oil, and gas deep underground. And thus, as we've exploited those hydrocarbons, and as we have warmed our homes over millennia, so we have warmed our planet. The impact over many centuries was initially gradual, but in my adult lifetime, we've seen a sudden acceleration in global warming, to the point where scientists warn that we may be reaching a point of no return. And similarly, our impact on the landscape around us began gradually, as we chopped down trees and brought fields under cultivation, built cities, and connected them with a network of transport links. But again, in the past century, that process of agricultural intensification, deforestation, urbanization, and globalization has led to dramatic changes in the balance of nature. Suddenly, the natural world that our parents knew has been transformed. Over the last 10 years, we've seen a 21% reduction in the number of African elephants. Over the course of the last 100 years, a 90% reduction. And also in the last 100 years, there has been a 97% decrease in the number of wildflower meadows in our country. In the last 40 years worldwide, 60% of the mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and birds with whom we share this planet have gone. In our own nation, almost all the indices of nature's resilience and abundance have declined. The population of farmland birds, a reliable indicator of farmland biodiversity, is down by 57% since 1970. Mammals, from hedgehogs to water voles, have seen numbers drop precipitately in recent years. Our salmon rivers have been denuded, pollinator habitats have been eroded, and our coastlines choked by plastic. This accelerating pace of environmental change, global warming, habitat destruction, biodiversity loss, raises profound questions about our relationship with the planet which is our only home. And in considering how we resolve these questions, I believe there's a deep reservoir of wisdom and guidance which policymakers can draw on from our religious traditions and faith leaders. Now, I speak as a Christian, convinced that the moral teachings of the Christian church, the example of Christ's life, and Christian theology all help us in reflecting on the responsibilities that we have to others. But I also think we can all learn and benefit from engaging with the ethical teachings of other faiths. And on the question of our responsibility towards creation, they speak with striking unanimity. At the heart of the Jewish faith is the doctrine of Baal Tashit, which means do not destroy, rooted in the book of Deuteronomy. Baal Tashit encourages all to refrain from the destruction of the fruitful and beautiful in this world. And in his wonderful work, The Dignity of Difference, Jonathan Sachs, the former chief rabbi, outlines how religious thinking can help us all better understand our duties to nature. As Lord Sachs writes, constructing an environmental ethic in strictly secular terms has proved unexpectedly difficult. On what basis do we owe duties to nature, given that nature does not recognize duties to itself or to us, and thus lies outside the domain of contracts and reciprocity? In what sense do we owe duties to generations as yet unborn, who are clearly not moral agents themselves, since they do not yet exist? On what rational basis are we to factor future loss of biodiversity against present gain? The power, he writes, of religious imagination is not that it has easy answers to difficult questions, but that it provides a framework of thought for such large and intractable issues. It's easier to understand the moral constraints on action 
when we believe that there is someone to whom we owe responsibility, that we're not owners of the planet, and that we are linked covenantally to those who will come after us. The simplest image, and truly the most sensible one, in thinking about our ecological responsibilities, is to see the Earth as belonging to the source being, and us as its trustees, charged with conserving, and if possible, beautifying it for the sake of our grandchildren not yet born. Muslims also see themselves as having a responsibility towards the world and the environment, all of which are the creations of Allah. The Prophet Muhammad understood the value of nature and that the mindful use of its bounty by humans represents a form of charity, almost a sacred duty, on behalf of both God's creation and other human beings. For Sikhs, Waheguru, or God, created the world as a place where every type of plant and animal could live in balance. In Sikh hymns, God is often the provider for all life, which God loves, guaranteeing equality to man and woman in faith and compassion towards all beings and nature. There is no difference between the world of humans and the world of nature. Both are equally important and must be treated with respect. And the value of the natural world is equally prized in Hinduism. Its teaching holds that each of our actions affects, for better or for worse, the created world to which we are inescapably bound. And for Buddhists too, respect for nature is of course integral to faith. The Dalai Lama has repeatedly called for strong action to combat climate change, and the Buddhist monk and environmental campaigner Thich Nhat Hanh neatly summed up the striking unanimity we see in the attitude of major religions, and indeed, in the case of many non-believers, to the environment. Whatever nationality or culture we belong to, he told the UN ahead of the Paris Climate Summit of 2015, whatever religion we follow, whether we're Buddhists, Christians, Muslims, Jews, or atheists, we can all see that the earth is not inert matter. She's a great being who has herself given birth to many other great beings, nurturing and protecting all peoples and all species without discrimination. When you realize the earth is so much more than simply your environment, you'll be moved to protect her in the same way as you would yourself. This is the kind of awareness that we need, and the future of the planet depends on whether we're able to cultivate this insight or not. For Christians, the ethical responsibility that we have towards the environment is of course encapsulated in the concept of stewardship. Christians are called to remember their rightful place within creation and the vast web of life it has created and their responsibility to protect and defend it. In the Catholic Catechism, there are long-standing arguments that environmental degradation is a violation of the seventh commandment, thou shalt not steal, because it is to steal prosperity from future generations and the poor if we leave the world despoiled and defiled. What kind of world do we want to leave to those who come after us, to children, who are now growing up. That question is one that runs through this government's 25-year environment plan, which we hope will help us to deliver on our ambition to leave our environment in a better state than we inherited it for the next generation. But it is also the essential theme of one of the most comprehensive and thoughtful expositions of Christian thinking on the environment, Laudato Si, the papal encyclical issued by Pope Francis in 2015, just before those Paris climate talks. Laudato Si analyzed climate change in the context explicitly of spiritual and religious values, in keeping with the Catholic thinking, which I referenced earlier, which places an emphasis on the cultivation of virtue rather than unfettered liberty or the accumulation of material wealth as mankind's principal goal. In my view, the encyclical is remarkable for the depth of thought which it goes into addressing the twin challenges of climate change and social justice, and for considering in depth both the science and the theology of climate change and also for exploring the spiritual, ethical, and religious dimensions of one of the greatest challenges facing the world. The title, Laudato Si, or Praise Be to You, My Lord, was inspired by the words of the 13th century saint, social campaigner, and lover of nature, Francis of Assisi, after whom the Pope deliberately took his name. Born Giovanni Bernardoni, the son of a wealthy merchant, he was expected to follow his father into the family business. Instead, when still a young man, a vision persuaded him to renounce a life of comfort and to lead a humble existence in poverty and service to God and to his fellow man. And it was in the Sistine Chapel, as the papal conclave of 2013 was coming to an end, beneath Michelangelo's vision of creation depicted as a gift from the outstretched hand of the Father, that the new Pope decided, or was moved to decide, that he would be called after St. Francis. A close friend among the cardinals, seeing which way the votes were going, had embraced him with the words, don't forget the poor. And as the Pope later explained, his thoughts went to St. Francis, 
patron saint of animals and ecology, whom he regarded as the man of poverty, the man of peace, the man who loves and protects creation. The same created world, the Pope added, with which we no longer have such a good relationship. Laudato Si, of course, was how St. Francis sought to honor God in his famous religious song, the Canticle of the Creatures, also known as the Canticle of the Sun. In this, he expressed the desire that man and nature should be one, sharing a love of the earth and all God's creatures in it. Written near the end of his life, around 1225, it's familiar to those of us in Anglican congregations as the source of the words to the hymn, all creatures of our God and King. Significantly, the creatures in question are not just the animals of which St. Francis was famously fond, but all of nature, the earthly elements and the essentials of all life. In the hymn, these appear as the burning sun with golden beam, the silver moon with softer gleam, and the fire so masterful and bright, the rushing wind, the clouds that sail in heaven, and thy flowing water, pure and clear. All of these manifestations of nature owe their existence to God, and should therefore raise their voices, as we should, in thanks to him. In his encyclical, Pope Francis is true to his predecessor and namesake in developing the centuries-old theme of the earth as our common home. It is, he writes, like a sister with whom we share our life and a beautiful mother who opens her arms to embrace us. People have forgotten, he writes, that we ourselves are dust of the earth. Our very bodies are made up of her elements. We breathe her air and we receive life and refreshment from her waters. All life depends on clean air and water and a stable and reliable climate, he argues. The climate is the quintessence of what is a common good, belonging to all and meant for all. And he is troubled by the resources that we squander and the waste we create as we try in vain to buy, own, and consume our way to happiness. The arguments of Laudato Si, as one would expect from any papal encyclical, are sophisticated and rich, and they are worthy of exploration here this evening. Because at its heart I are, I believe, critical lessons in one of the finest expositions of the importance of the environment from a Christian perspective. Each community, the Pope argues, can take from the bounty of the earth whatever it needs for abundant life. But the harvest for the world must be a sustainable one. We have a duty to protect the planet and ensure its fruitful abundance for coming generations. And the guiding principle which the Pope took from his 2013 conclave was the need to look after our poor. And the Pope argues that the earth, burdened and laid waste, is among the most abandoned and maltreated of our poor. It is beginning to look more and more like an immense rubbish heap. Never have we treated our common home as badly as we have in the last 200 years. Instead of a legacy of a better environment for future generations, we threaten, he believes, to leave them in the rubble, deserts, and refuse. Too many countries, he argues, are putting their natural interests above the global common good. And as individuals too, we should be painfully aware of what is happening to the world. We should regard this as our personal suffering and therefore learn what each of us can do to bring about change. And lastly, again, in his consistency of thought and commitment to the poor, he argues that a true ecological approach must always become a social approach. It must integrate questions of social justice in debates on the environment so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Pope Francis makes the point that we're not faced with two separate crises afflicting the environment and society. Rather, the world is facing a single complex crisis. The solution, he believes, must be to combat poverty and restore dignity to the underprivileged at the same time as protecting nature. And that insight is, I believe, fundamental. We must ensure that we are not just careful stewards of creation, but also warriors for social justice too. We need both to protect our natural inheritance and bring a richer life to more. In the Pope's vision of an integral ecology which respects the needs of humans, society, and the environment, Christians' role as a protector of God's handiwork is a vocation, one essential to a life of virtue. Now, as everyone here knows, in its importance, an encyclical is only one step down from a papal bull. And the decision by Pope Francis to tackle climate change and the environment so early in his papacy, just two years after his election, reflected the urgency that he felt about entering a dialogue with people about our common home. And the Vatican was also aware that international leaders would be meeting at the end of 2015 for that landmark conference on climate change. The Pope saw the change to initiate open debate in this country and in others at every level of social, economic, and political life. And of course, he was also motivated by the knowledge that while climate change itself 
cannot be blamed for growing wealth inequality. The poorest people who are least responsible for climate change are those most affected by it. Global warming affects poor and marginalized communities hardest. And in coming years, they will look to receive what Mary Robinson, the former Irish president and UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, has called climate justice. The responsibility on us all to share out the burdens of climate change, a principle which is built into the UK climate change targets that Ed Miliband and Gordon Brown introduced. During their papacies, both John Paul II and Benedict XVI spoke of the Christian requirement to honour the creation and to protect the least fortunate in society. Benedict, who of course was Pope from 2005 until 2013, talked also about how important it was to make better use of natural resources and how the deterioration of nature was connected with human culture. But what is striking about, how, about Laudato Si is how, as Pope Francis explores the relationship between global poverty and social inequality in even greater depth, he puts environmental protection so much to the fore. And as you would expect of a man with a qualification in chemistry, the work is founded on science, setting out the status quo based on the best available scientific findings. He believes, and I agree, that we have been learning too slowly the lessons of environmental deterioration. In pursuing ever more production, scant regard has been paid to the toll that it has been taking on resources and indeed the health of the environment. That businesses profit by calculating and paying only a fraction of the costs entailed in increasing desertification, in the harm done to biodiversity or increased pollution needs reform. And indeed, if present tre uh, trends continue unchecked, the century may well witness extraordinary climate change and an unprecedented destruction of ecosystems with serious consequences for all humanity. The Pope reflecting on these uh, developments seeks in the encyclical to encourage a culture of care which permeates society, linking individuals, families, local communities, national governments, and other countries. And he borrows a phrase from another distinguished predecessor, John Paul II, when he urges each element to undergo an ecological conversion. He correctly identifies that the pressure to tread more lightly on the planet is coming from the young. Intergenerational solidarity is not just a nice to have, it's a basic question of justice because the world in which we live belongs to those who follow us. So what are the solutions? Well, I think the Pope outlined solutions in Laudato Si with which we can all agree. Wise environmental policies, like those now being pursued across the world and which are increasingly being adopted by individuals as well as governments, can make a difference. Measures that move us to a lower carbon economy, reduce greenhouse gases and other highly polluting emissions, for example, by substituting fossil fuels for renewable energy, can make a difference. On an individual level, we can all consider reducing our use of plastic and paper, reducing our water consumption, separating out our waste for recycling, cooking only what we can reasonably consume, and making sure anything left over is shared with those who need it most, showing care for other living beings, all because there is a nobility in the duty to care for all creation through our own daily actions. And at a national level, countries can show enhanced statecraft. We can think of the long-term good of all on the planet that we share. And those countries which are most powerful and most wealthy have a particular responsibility, because we pollute the most, to consider how our actions have affected less fortunate societies on the other side of the globe. Humanity can still work together to heal our common home. Human beings, while capable of the worst, are also capable of rising above themselves, choosing again what is good and making a new start. And I believe it is crucial that every ecological approach that we contemplate incorporates the social perspective of which the Pope has taken such particular care to articulate the compelling reasons for, and takes into account the fundamental rights of the poor and the underprivileged. The Pope himself has argued, unless we struggle with these deeper issues, I do not believe that our concern for ecology will produce significant results. And I think the Holy Father is absolutely right to unite the causes of environmental protection and social justice in the way that he has, and in the way that so many governments now recognize they have to be. But also, in meeting both of those needs, I think we also need to bring together two other traditions, two scientific rather than faith traditions, which have in the past sometimes seemed to be intention or even contradiction. The brilliant American writer Charles Mann published a remarkable book earlier this year 
which told the tale of two of the most influential, but perhaps least celebrated, great thinkers of the 20th century. His book, The Wizard and the Prophet, introduces the reader to the achievements of two American scientists, William Vogt and Norman Borlaug. Vogt is the father of modern environmentalism. He made the case for a world of both limits and awe. He saw in growing material affluence the seeds of future disintegration, but he also believed there was an intrinsic worth and wonder in a planet in balance. He was the prophet of man's title, warning of the impact of industrialization and urbanization on Earth's resilience and beauty. And Norman Borlaug was the wizard. He was the father of the 1960s Green Revolution, which deployed new agricultural technology and genetic breakthroughs to massively increase crop yields and improve food production, not least in the developing world. As Mann explains in his book, these two scientific thinkers were not just at odds themselves over the dangers and promise of economic growth, they also inspired two generally contending schools of thought about how to shape our future. In essence, the Votian view was a conservative philosophy of care, a belief that nature's precious resources needed protection from man's rapacity and hubris. It was all about valuing the creation, of which, as I have explained, we are all part. The Borlogian outlook was a liberal philosophy of potential, a belief that man could use his reasoning intellect to find solutions to the problems of life on this planet. It was all about valuing the creativity with which we are all endowed. Both views have, in the way in which they've become articulated, become polarized in some of our contemporary debates. Those who argue for lower growth in the name of sustainability versus those who argue for higher growth to generate the resources that we need to meet and master environmental and social challenges. On the one hand, there are those who argue for an approach to life which is slower, more rooted, more organic, and more humble, with man acknowledging his dependence on nature rather than seeking to assert mastery. But on the other side, there are those who argue for accelerating innovation, building on the power of science to reshape our expectations of the possible, and declining to retreat in the face of great challenges. It's my belief that faced with these two powerful, contending visions, the wisest way forward rests in harnessing the best of both. But then again, as someone who worships in an Anglican church, I suppose I would say that, wouldn't I? But the via media that I think we should follow is not a splitting down the middle of these arguments, but a radical fusion. It is the case, as I argued earlier, that we have caused environmental damage and deterioration on a dramatic scale in the last century, with pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity loss, habitat erosion, soil depletion, and deforestation. That does require us to think more carefully than ever before about how we use resources, how we protect what is precious and irreplaceable, how we manage our way out of methods of production and patterns of consumption which are wasteful and profligate. We have to learn from vote. But I also believe that the best way to ensure that we use limited resources more widely is to increase the productivity of those resources through restraint, reuse, and recycling, all of which are made easier by technological advance. The most effective way of sparing land for wildlife is by making sure that we sustainably, sustainably increase the yield from the land that we do use for food production. The sustainable productivity of that land and the overall health of the environment on which we rely is maximized if we can develop techniques that reduce the need for excessive inputs, whether of energy or chemicals, and instead concentrate on the thoughtful cultivation of better outputs. It is also the case that as societies get wealthier, much of our consumer appetite and extra spending is directed at services rather than objects, and those objects that we do buy tend to be of better quality. Spending more on quality is usually good, a bespoke suit's expensive, but the impact of its production on the environment is little more than it would be from buying one off the peg. That's the principal reason why, as we grow richer, it is possible to increase resource productivity and, indeed, human satisfaction, and yet also respect the need for a lighter environmental footprint. So what does this all mean in practical terms? Well, I think, I would, wouldn't I, that the approach taken by the UK government through our 25-year environment plan, our new agriculture and fisheries bills, and our proposed environment bill help to show us the way. This government, like so many others, has put a special emphasis on careful use of existing natural resources and greater resource productivity. Taxes designed to reduce demand for virgin plastics will, they already are, encouraging greater recycling, greater investment in research, and innovation. I also believe that that investment in research and innovation will help us to unlock the potential of even greater resource efficiency. It will also help us to develop new initiatives to reduce food waste. And we also have a plan 
uh, in government to redistribute nutritious food which goes unsold to those most in need. All of these policies are evidence of our commitment to treading more lightly on our planet and also uniting environmental concerns with a commitment to greater social justice. And in our 25-year environment plan, we also set ambitions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, bring down the level of harmful pollutants in the air we breathe and in the water that we drink, to make more space for nature and to restore to health the habitats on which our beautiful wildlife depend. All of these principles are underpinned by new structures to keep government more honest and more accountable for the delivery of these goals. And alongside these commitments to protect what we've inherited, to use our endowment of natural capital wisely, and to honour our covenant with future generations by enhancing our environment, we're also determined to utilise the gains of science and the fruits of innovation to make that growth in the future both more fruitful and sustainable. If, as Christians, we believe that creation is a gift that we must preserve, then we must also believe that creativity, with which we've been endowed, is a gift that we must use to the full. So, when it comes to the agriculture of the future, we must develop new technologies which improve productivity while also respecting nature's limits. That means, I think, precision farming, with chemicals applied sparingly and with care, to minimise costs and externalities and to maximise productivity in a balanced way. It will also require us to use big data, robotics, machine learning and artificial intelligence to analyse, um, audit and refine how we grow food best and where to target resources to greatest effect. It will also mean learning from other nations and indeed from the most skilled farmers in our own country about applying the best husbandry and rearing techniques to ensure that high quality food is grown with minimal environmental impact and maximum nutritional value. In addition, I believe that we will have to be open to how gene technology can develop in the future. There are huge questions, ethical and scientific, about where such technology can lead, but the ability of gene editing to accelerate advances that we have already secured in plants and animals through selective breeding in a way which is both safe and fair to all is potentially huge. And we will, I think, also have to contemplate how we can make the most constructive use of vertical farming, whether through hydroponics or other techniques. Vertical farming involves growing salad and other vegetables in controlled indoor surroundings, where the amount of water, nutrients, and light can be precisely controlled. It has the potential to massively increase yields while dramatically reducing the environmental footprint of production and also releasing land for nature. Plants nurtured indoors in optimal conditions and multi-storey units under heaters and lights can grow 24-7, not only when the sun shines and the weather is warm. There are other as yet embryonic scientific techniques which could help us feed the world more sustainably, from the development of synthetic proteins to more thoughtfully designed aquaculture, which should be explored, albeit always with great care. All of these innovations will depend on unleashing the Borlogian creativity of our finest scientific minds, but the breakthroughs they might generate also need to be weighed with votian caution as we consider what the long-lasting impact on our world might be. I believe that if we can balance both respect for nature with a resolution to push the boundaries of science, restraint in how we exploit the resources available to us today with a rigorous focus on generating sustainably greater abundance in the future, then I believe that we can both protect our planet, our home, our creation, and provide the world's poor with a promise of plenty. I want to end by quoting from the wonderful charity WWF, which does so much to care for our, our common home. WWF has argued that this generation is perhaps the first to fully understand the damage that we are doing to our world, and it therefore falls to our generation to be the one to do something about it before it is too late, to take the kind of critical decisions that I have been speaking about this evening. The chance is still ours to forge a new relationship with this planet, with creation. As religious leaders down the ages have urged, we can be better stewards of our earth, and we can also plant a harvest for the world. And that is surely a mission which can unite us all. Thank you.